Previously on Quest Laid Plans. We open our saga in Dawnlight, the home of St. Simone's Adventuring Guild that produced the heroes who saved the world a decade ago at the fateful Battle of Horizon Fall. Victory would not have been possible if the leader of the party, the elven paladin Chiron O'Marale, had not sacrificed her life to ensure the Dreadnought's demise. It is now the 10th anniversary of the Battle of Horizon Fall, and we see Dawnlight and St. Simone's bustling in preparation for a great celebration. My character is a human sorcerer named Esther Miffians, definitely a golden boy in every sense of the word. Are there any questions? There should be. I am Kit Marpola. I am a water genasi monk. We have a long tradition of channeling our feelings and our anger into productive, defensive, helpful means. Kit's really confused about what's going on with Esther because of the last conversation that we had. And is your old friend Porla? I mean, there's all so much more that we all could have done, right? This weekend is, is hard for everyone, and I just wanted to say I'm glad you're here. Are you organizing all of this? Yeah, I work here. Uh, jewelry. I'm selling jewelry. <laughs> Over here, if you want. Um, I'm, I'm Windswip, by the way. Like, the, your, your wind, like the Windswip. She's half gnome. She's half a genasi. <laughs> She's a genasi. <laughs> and you see your old friend, Aveline Yavri Skywatcher. Hey, stop making s'mores on my familiar. Addie is a dick dick, which is a <laughs> tiny antelope. She is a dick dick made of fire. How are you doing? How have the last 10 years been? It's wild when you just put it out there. 10 whole years, my goodness. My character's name is Noraya. Uh, Lightfoot Halfling, all of you remember her as a rogue, but she looks like she may or may not have some magic on her as well. And it is your old party mate, Brex, and you you hear them go, Oi! <laughs> have you talked to Paula at all? Um, it's hard to describe what Paula's deal is unless you've seen it. We gotta go, right? I guess I fucking have to, right? Yeah. I mean, it's for Chiron. All right, well, let's just suck it up and go then. Maybe there'll be lots of alcohol there. Welcome to Quest Laid Plans, the podcast that asks the question, can an old party learn new tricks? I'm Megan Kelleher. I am your dungeon master. And with me are five people who just showed up at my doorstep. Hi, I'm stranger number one, Maya S. Ming, and I play Windswip Palm, Air Genazi Gnome, Rune Fighter. I'm Phil Arevalo. I'm playing Kit Marpola, a water genasi monk. I am Jesse B. Kohler, playing the human boy. Golden Boy, Esther Miffian's Sorcerer. Hi, I'm Jamie Hathaway, and I'm playing Aveline Yavri Skywatcher with a loyal dick dick familiar Addy. Hi, I'm Neta Marie Votova, and I play the halfling wizard rogue Naraya Winsworn, a stranger to everyone here. I feel like Jesse's character's business card does say Esther Miffian's comma, sorcerer. <laughs> Human boy, golden boy. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we play some d d <laughs> We love it. As you head out of the house and in onto campus, you see that the sun is starting to go down. We head back over to the drinks tent where we see Aveline and we see Windswip. And uh, Kit, you see these two friends enter that you haven't seen in a while. What do you do? Yeah, so at the drinks tent, I've actually set up a table that says, hit me and get a free sample of our organic sake. <laughs> So, and, and like I'm sort of cursing myself because I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot to mention during that presentation that we have organic sake. These kids love that shit. I should have <laughs> mentioned it. Okay. All right. So I, I'm just standing there. I have these bottles of sake that have like an Asian moon bear on it as like the symbol of the monastery. And I, I have my monk headband on. I have my like Eskrima sticks kind of ready to go. And I'm just sort of like trying to look tough. <laughs> 
looking around. No one's taken me up on this offer to like hit me because they think it's totally not like worth it at all. And I look over, I see Windswip and Aveline, and I immediately I catch their I catch Aveline's eye first, I think, because I'm about I'm a little shorter than her, like five I'm like five ten. To say, hey, hey, nice to see you. I know it hasn't been so long, but why do you why do you come over? And I give Aveline a hug. <laughs> This is this is not what Aveline was expecting because uh, yeah. she walks in, sees you standing in front of like the table with the sign that says like "Hit me for a free drink." And so as you go in for the hug, Aveline has like half drawn out the quarter staff and is like going for a hit, and you kind of just awkwardly hug yourself onto a quarter staff <laughs> that has shillelagh like active on it. Um, Aveline, Aveline, I, I need you to make an attack roll. <laughs> Oh, no. I need you to make an attack roll. Okay. PVP already. Yeah, get that PVP. <laughs> the first going. attack of the game is an accidental <laughs> PVP. Can we can we say I have cast the shillelagh cantrip immediately so that that's already active? Yeah, it's a cantrip, so why not? Yeah. So I have a plus eight to hit with this. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. That's only a nine, so a 17 to hit. That that hits. <laughs> Oh good, god, good, good. so Kit, you go in for a hug and you you get you get a shillelagh to the You take eleven damage. <laughs> That's uh five <laughs> question mark. <laughs> so yeah, you're like basically drawing the shillelagh and I'm coming in for the hug and it just whacks me like straight across the face. Uh, <laughs> Because, like, I'm coming in to hug it, yeah. like, at, at I'm, like, like still level. extending to go for, like, a chest hit or something as you're coming towards. So I just sock you right in the middle of the chest with my shillelagh quarter stuff. And it hits me. I look down and I, I see Windswip and I'm like, uh, oh. Uh -huh. Aveline! And Windswip is, like, just instantly Hi. going to help brace Kit as he kind of stumbles back. Oh, wow. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm I, I'm, I'm good. Long, uh, long, long time no, see, why, why don't... <gasps> Aveline, oh, that really fucking hurt, but... I, I'm sorry, dude. Have some sake. You, Windswip, you, you come too. Let's, let's just have a drink. I was, I was gonna do a cool thing where it was like, hey, Windswip, look, it's Kit. And then I was gonna, like, walk up and hit you and be like, ha, ah, free drinks and pretend like we hadn't seen each other recently, but um, you trying to hug me kind of undercut the whole thing. So let's, uh, let's just have a drink. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 fine, and I I pour them some of the sake. Oh wow, you've 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 seen each other recently. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Aveline, uh Yeah, she was. Uh, she came over. What like? Uh, well, less than a year ago, right? Just a couple of months ago, yeah, you were over, and a few months we, ago. we had a good good had a good chat. Aveline uh, intentionally projects their voice a little bit and is like, "Yeah, that monastery on the volcano is really cool. Anyone who doesn't know what to do with their life would love." The volcano. Hitting stuff okay. on the God. volcano. Give me a persuasion check, Aveline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do I add to persuasion? That is an 11. Total? Yep, total. I rolled a 10 and it's plus one. You see you see a couple kids look up and then they look at you and for a minute they're like, hmm. And then they look at Kit who's just like clutching his <laughs> chest and staggering <laughs> and like shakily pouring out some sake. And they're like, nah. I... Oh, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> I'm like packing up the table after I poured the sake while I'm, I'm talking to you guys. I say, yeah, so uh, yeah, Aveline and I, we, yeah, she came over, you know, we, we had a good chat. Uh, you know, we talked about our, our sweet new jewelry. Like uh, I, I oh. you saw her necklace, right? Like, do you see, I, I got uh -huh. some pretty, uh, pretty sweet uh, necklace too. Yeah, no, I, I saw that Vol volcano, right? That's, that's new, right? Yeah, um, so, yeah, maybe started not. Maybe a... Maybe not uh, new, new, but, um... Yeah, so, we're recruiting because, uh, I got to start, like, a satellite facility. Oh. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of it, and, uh, you know, my, uh, my, uh, um, I, I have a life partner, Sampa. Oh. She's, uh, yeah, no, she, she's helping me, and, you know, when we... When she downs the shot. Kids. <laughs> While he's talking. So yeah, things are things are going going great. How have you been? Um I've been great. I've been 
is that Porla <laughs> over there? And she just fully leaves. <laughs> I don't even know if she saw Porla. She just left. <laughs> you skedaddle off out of the tent. I look at Aveline and I'm like, um, I didn't tell you this when you came before, uh, but uh, Winswip did come to visit me. Didn't. You also was a little weird. didn't mention the life part. She hasn't really thing. seen me since. We were talking about the obsidian and we talked about gender and religion, but um, long term relationships? I mean, good for you, but. Yeah. Um, that's usually a thing people lead with, right? Um, when you haven't seen one someone for nine years. It's like, <laughs> hey, here's my sweet volcano monastery. Here's my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Here's all uh, the kids I'm helping to raise. Um, oh God. Are you raising um, them with anyone? <laughs> that would be a normal way to lead their kid. Y- yeah, so I might have left, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, this has been a little. I'm going to. I I need to use the, the, the bathroom. I'll be, I'll be back in a bit. In a long time. In a long time. In a long time. <laughs> Listen, sometimes you wanna <laughs> sometimes you wanna be honest with people and set up the right expectations. As you leave the tent, as you are stepping out, you you hear the great booming voice of the lion guy from before. You know that is Kyralius Murray, who is the head of the adventuring guild. He is a has he has been there since before your time as an adventurer here and has not changed a bit at all except there's a little bit more gray in his mane and without turning around kit you hear him go all right everybody it's time for the dinner the food's ready and the music is hot and we are all ready to cut a rug let's all go uh uh Ky- Ky- I-, I-, I like i like elbow him as i go past like Ky- kyrelius can i uh can you change my table <gasps> <gasps> Excuse me, this is where Naraya is just entering the situation with, Fuck no, you're not changing his table. Kit, if I'm coming, you're coming. We're all sitting at the same table. (laughs) Kit, how is it possible you got more awkward in the last 10 years? I didn't think it was possible. (laughs) Hi, hello. We're sitting at the same table. Oh, oh, hi. Oh, long, really fucking time. Whoa, jeez, long time I'm like holding my arms out for a hug. I, I like I like very tentatively go in for a hug and as I'm hugging it presses like the hug is a little too tight it presses <laughs> against my chest which was like just hit I'm like oh are you hurt I'm fine you fight <laughs> are you fighting at the reunion already no no who are you who are I'm you not, fighting I'm not um you know what let's let's just go over to the dinner let's just go sit at our own table that we have with all of our old friends friends. Exactly, friends. Kyrelius is like, uh, yes, that's that's the right idea. We've got, come on, uh, let's let's go on over to the dinner and uh, we can all catch up I then. Can, Kyrelius, hi. Hello, Naraya. Wow, look at you. Sorry to interrupt. I just didn't want my very good friends to be changing tables at this important event that I really wanted to attend with everyone I know. No, of course, of course, you're the guests of honor and you've got the table of honor. Come on, I'll show you. And uh, and he he kind of leads you off into a, a different tent, which is much bigger and much fancier. It wasn't there before. You can kind of tell that it's uh, it's just been set up perhaps by the people that Porla was, was trying to deal with. And uh, as you enter, you see that it's really beautifully lit inside. It's gotten dark outside and there's all sorts of like magical and non-magical fairy lights everywhere in lots of different colors. There's tons of round tables with white cloths and folding chairs. It's kind of like any prom that you've been to and there's like in the center there's like a big dance floor you see at the at the far end um you see a a, a dj that's a turtle man with headphones <laughs> a turtle with headphones <laughs> this is where i get represented uh hear that fan oh. artist any fan art of the party you do have to include megan the dm as a turtle with Our headphones dm as a turtle dm dj the DM official DJ, fan cast turtle headphones blue hair glasses can't be stopped yeah this is my this is my um dm pc <laughs> uh, <laughs> god damn it i could have saved it and, but instead Brex i blew and it on the not involved in the campaign <laughs> this unnamed turtle dj absolutely key to the whole story he's actually the big bad evil guy 
damn it. Uh, I roll an investigation check on Um, the DJ. No, you see that the (laughs) DJ is fucking like popping off, like going hard, raging to like some really, (laughs) really like down tempo bossa nova. Is it a Hosea cover? (laughs) Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, Sure, it's a bossa nova cover of of Take Me to Church. It's like, do, do, do. Do 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 my lover's got do 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 humor. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's laughs. That's laughs. But also, like, change it just enough that we do not get sued by Andrew Hosier. This is an alternate universe, Andrew Hosier. <laughs> and the pantheon is different, so it's a different church. Which church did Andrew Hosier want to go to? He didn't live long enough to pick a god. Sadly, he was uh, killed. He was one of the so first So he was just to go. begging for the, he was begging for the concept of church. This is, I feel like I need to explain this to the listeners and the rest of the party. The very first thing we did that was even, like, vaguely in the world of this campaign is that me and Netta and Jamie played The Quiet Year, which is Avery Alder who wrote that and so we were like what if we build a world that is maybe the basis of this world and in many but not always I did use um, a lot of what we came up with (laughs) and one of the things uh, was that one of the original um, survivors of the apocalypse happened to be a uh, hosier and he started an interspecies acapella group with some sentient animals and was sadly murdered by some barbecue dads who were, th- were threatened by his uh, tender masculinity. Like you do. That's like the way you do. It goes. So, uh, and I, I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's <laughs> actually canon or not because I can't have that fucking blood on my hands. Okay, so anyway, the turtle is popping off in a way that <laughs> didn't merit that much description. <laughs> And, and you find, uh, you see Kyrelius kind of lead you to uh, this table. It's, it really looks like a place of honor. It's it's sort of like in the middle of everything. It's visible by everybody. It's very well lit by like kind of a drop spot that's like not so subtle. It is in a prime location near both the buffet and the, the DJ without being too loud. Just like A plus table. I, I think Esther is already sitting at the table. But in like the like lean like leaning on the table, like not in a chair, like like resting like on the table <laughs> and is like talking. And uh, it's like a little bit shorter than would be it's not like yeah, a cocktail yeah, high top. Yeah, it's yeah, like... yeah, yeah. <laughs> and is uh talking to like has just like trapped one of the like servers, even though it is a buffet, so maybe this person has I Esther has mistaken them. Um <laughs> but is talking to one of the servers and is like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the most noble professions, what you do. I mean, you're, you're, you're on your feet every day. You're changing the game. I think it's really incredible. <laughs> the waiter's like, thanks, man. Like, it's all about, uh, like, hustle and grind. You know what I mean? Like, you got to, like, rise and grind, get to work, get the, get the cocktails in the hands of the people. And then the second that it's even a little bit low, like, the second that the ice is, like, a little bit unsubmerged from the drink, you got to swoop in. You got to get another one because you got to make that money. Absolutely, man. I mean, yeah, sure. But I, my, my question for you, though, is are you grinding yourself? Isn't that the key, right? Are you on the grind of yourself? Because if you, you can be doing whatever job you want, but if you're changing yourself every day, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if that ice is dropping. What matters is if you're dropping. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you are you propositioning me for sex? Um, no, because you're 19, 20. How did you know that? It's all over your face, my friend. But I will take another gin and tonic, and you can hold the tonic. Uh, yes, sir. Um, <laughs> he leaves Ooh. awkwardly. Oh, Jesus. So you catch the tail end of this as uh, the rest of you approach the table. As a way of greeting, Esther feels just a tiny pinch on, like, his forearm. What the hell is that? What? Are you hitting on a child? I'm... <laughs> advising the children what we're here to do, Naraya. I'm trying to help guide. You should not be doing any of that. Why? This person's probably making, I don't know how much money, because Pearl is paying them, apparently. Hopefully it's good money, but they're not here to listen to whatever that was. That was kind of weird. Hi. Hi, um, hi, Brex. Do you, uh, you got enough belts there? I could always use a couple more, you know. <laughs> but have you considered, are you grinding your belts? Okay. All right. Let's sit down. Thank <laughs> that's, uh, that's you. Or are the belts grinding okay. you? All right. Uh, it depends okay. on how I'm feeling okay. on the night. You great. know what I mean? Great, great, great. 
Great. Awesome. So happy to be back. What does that even mean? It, Esther. it doesn't need to mean anything, Naraya. It just needs to inspire. I'm just trying to get out of this weekend. Fine. Okay. That's all it means. That's what it means. Can we just sit down? Is, is this what you took away from our conversation? Is this? This? Hi, Kit. It's been seven years since we've talked, so maybe some other stuff has happened since we've last chatted. Oh but my god, can we not go into this with this energy? Yeah, I'm fine. fine. And Naraya sits down. Fine. Yeah. Where's Winsworth? I'm great. Where is Winsworth? Because <laughs> Aveline is still sitting at uh, Kit's recently Winsworth? vacated table just drinking sake <laughs> and trying to jump like... <laughs> drum up the courage to go and see more people, <laughs> given that the one person that she had spoken to in the last ten years, she's just accidentally injured, and then he's had a really awkward thing and left. Um, <laughs> so she's not in the tent yet. Um, I think actually Winslow will come back into the tent, but she went to go I didn't really describe what she was wearing before, but now she kind of has thrown on kind of a, a suit of like dressy sort of chainmail armor, kind of gold and white in preparation uh, for the evening. And she comes back in and kind of is very scoping out the uh, where Kit was, um, but then just sees Aveline and seems to oh, breathe in relief and uh, goes over to her again and says, um, are you going to go in? Uh, the dinner is about to start. Are you Are you good? Can we, should we go yeah, in okay, together? Let's, um... Maybe? Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. I thought that was a very, um, I thought that was a very good hit that Thank you did. Thank you. It was, uh, it was really impressive. You know, I've been <laughs> practicing a little bit. I just wasn't expecting him to hug me. We spoke a few months ago, but like, I didn't know we were necessarily on hugging level. You know what? After one thing that I'm learning after all these years is Kit, he's hard to read. Oh, uh, let's go in. So they head into the dinner and I think they arrive at the table together. Oh, everyone's here. Hi! Hi! Hi, Esther! Hi, Hi Naraya! How are you? How is everybody? Great! No, one, no, one's, no one's fighting. No one's fighting. Hi. Oh, so just like old times, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> I, like, stand up to give her, like, a very big hug. Oh, the best, the biggest, tightest hug. Is Esther still kind of doing a little bit of a douchebag lean on the table? <laughs> no. No, no, no. Um, Esther is fully Then I think... That. Aveline kind of, instead of coming up and trying to knock one of his feet out from under him, just comes up and does a little kind of gentle shoulder punch and is like, hey, dude, how's it going? Hey, good, good. How are you? I accidentally hit Kit in the chest pretty hard. Yeah. And um, some teens wouldn't stop um, trying to Oh, nice. make s'mores on Addy. But it, yeah, fancy dinner, I guess. Oh, Aveline, I actually, I have something to show cool. you. Cool. What is it? Uh, come here. Come here. And I kind of like lead Aveline off. I step to the side. Okay. Ready? And then Esther casts uh, his fine familiar spell. <gasps> and a... Uh, <laughs> so this is a little decision I made. So Esther's familiar is a uh, Sheba Husky, which is a mix of a oh Sheba Inu and a Husky. <laughs> Um, but oh my God. A, a decision is that oh my God. I am going to, I'll roll a D4 every time I cast this spell. And based on like what it lands, the Sheba has like a different degree <laughs> of like how fucked up it is. So like a one, it's like extremely like posh. But then like, like a two, it's like, you know, how like some dogs, like their tongue is just always like drooping, like out of their mouth. And then I think like a four is just like the just mangiest like a super creature. Super feral little gremlin. Dog. Oh my god, it's Depiglio. It's like Depiglio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Please roll the d. So can can we get this roll, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing the roll. Okay, so it's a three. So not the greatest looking uh, pup. Um, so I think like like the tail is like the hair doesn't go all the way to the end. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like a little like rough. It's it's head is like maybe yeah. So maybe instead of it being like really high, it's more like that feral like holding its head kind of low. Just the worst talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like Esther just kind of like does this like I don't know what the way of casting the fine familiar like if it's like uh, I have to say something or it's like a hand motion. Is this is this new? Did Esther learn this? recently mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Oh this my is god, new. dude! Now I don't have to be the only person who's hiding an animal under the table at fancy events. Exactly. We can get in trouble together again. <laughs> yeah. So I think Esther just is. I got Addie a friend. <laughs> And that friend is a is a dog with a high prey drive who is taller than my three and a half foot antelope. Good job, buddy. <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> Esther does not read the sarcasm at all. <laughs> Winsmith is gushing over Naraya, just like, I love that dress. It's a sweater and a dress, and it looks so good, and you look so good, and, um, oh, hey, Brex, oh my gosh, look at you, you're, you smell great. Yeah, I know, I thought I'd try something new. Uh, it's good to see you, and, uh, and they give you a, a hug. Naraya mouths, bitch, at Brex. Brex flashes Naraya a very pointy-toothed smile. You all see, actually, Kit, are you still at the table? I'm, I'm still at the table, but I'm... Kit I'm... is at the table, and I want to check in with Kit as Esther and Aveline walk away to do animal things. As that's happening, same time, still hugging, very much still hugging Winswip. Kit is... Did Aveline do that? That was... That was... That was a total misunderstanding. That was... Uh, that wasn't a big deal. I, you know, I was trying to recruit these kids and like... So you're you know, not I... fighting... Because you're having weird vibes. I'm sorry, but you're having weird vibes with Esther as well. And I... Are you fighting with everyone? I, I, I think I'm just... I'm not having... I'm not and having cuts the best in. Night. Oh, I, I just... I saw it all. It was just, you know, he was trying to demonstrate his cool monk skills. And Asleen took it a little too seriously. But they did great, though. They they hit him real good. <laughs> but that's all that is. Everything's everything's fine. Do you need a cleric? Uh, you know... Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to a cleric, but I, I think I, I need a therapist more than anything right now. Just as you say I wouldn't say no to a cleric, you feel a pair of brawny arms encircle you from behind and just shake the living daylights out of you and go, Oh, think fast, kid! Oh, oh God, oh, careful, oh, jeez. He's very hurt right now. Uh, I turn around. It is the hottest guy any of you have ever seen. <laughs> This extremely tall, broad-shouldered, jacked half-elf with, like, a ponytail and just these, like, really big, twinkly eyes. Beautiful teeth just, like, flashing at you with a smile as he's kind of half-hugging, half, like, squeezing to death. Kit from behind just like, ah, come on, fight back, buddy, like old times! I, I, I guess I try to, I try to break free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do a strength contest, oh I guess. Um, All right. Yeah, give me a strength check, and I'll I'll give you one too. Not like um, this might be my first. Role. I can't use like athletics or something. Mm, let's just call it a strength contest. Okay, then that's a twelve. All right, uh, you win by quite a lot. You fight back and you manage to break free of these beefy arms and you see, you turn around and you see this incredibly handsome dude uh, just sort of like laughing and like, hell yeah, yeah, just like we used to do. Remember we used to wrestle and <laughs> now we're doing wrestling again. Hi. 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 Um, it's good to see you again. Oh, it's so good to see you again. Two wins with my gosh, it's been so long. And yeah, it's just so, I'm so, so glad that you guys uh, were able to come. It just, I know it means so much to my family and like everything that happened. Like it just, yeah. Um, Can I, do I look at the face and do I recognize, does it look like someone else that I knew? Do we know this hot elf? Everybody give me a, a history check. Or an insight check. I don't say insight. I oh, think it's insight. insight. I roll, uh, can I roll, if I'm rolling an insight check, uh, I just rolled a nat 19 and I have plus seven to that. So that's a 26. So I think we have like. <laughs> nice. I'm going to say, hold on to that for now. I think that Esther and Aveline are still like a little ways away, but I'll c come back to that in a second. Uh, 14. 13. 12. Kit, I think it's you who puts together when you hear him say means a lot to my family you are like holy shit this is cabriel this is chiron's baby brother who was maybe like 13 14 last time you you met him he was one of those kids that like goes through puberty like wicked late so just like a really tiny kid now just the fucking like brawniest jackedest hottest 
half elf you have ever seen. And once you put it together, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, kind of same big eyes. But that's about it. <laughs> oh, my Gabriel. Oh yeah. God. Oh, my, oh my God. God. Gabriel. You. It's Gabriel. Oh, jeez. You... Wow. Oh, you're so big. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I did get really big. Um, you guys got older too. It's crazy how time works, right? I turned to Brex and I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. you, you were right. That's terrible. No one should say that to a person. <laughs> <laughs> how is, how's your family been? Um, I, I know that it was hard right after, but. Well, yeah, how, you know, I things? mean, like we're, uh, things are, you know, they're, they're better now. You know, I mean, like time helps with things. And, you know, it's just really nice that Porla put all this together for us. You know, Porla's, she was great. Uh, you know, she was kind of staying with our family for a little while, you know, before she came back to work here. And I think, I think she's doing better now. So it's just really great to see all you guys. I'm, you know, all over at my family's table, but I'll come, um, I'll come hang out with you guys a little later. I'm just like really starving. I have to eat like six, seven meals a day to just like maintain this. That's a lot. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. I gotta get those gains. Gotta, gotta get the gains, man. Like, bro, like you, you get it. Like, you know it. Yes. And, uh, and he, he turns around and then he goes, big dogs, big dogs, big dogs. And he, and he sees, uh, <laughs> the, the familiars and he runs over and he squats down. He's like, yes, big dogs. And he hugs them, including Addie, who's neither a dog nor very pleasant to touch. Yeah. <laughs> neither he's of like, them. Oh, the hot dog. are big. He looks up, he's like, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> and, and and just sort of like pats off his arm, um, which is on fire because, <laughs> because of hugging Addie. And he's sort of, and I think you got, uh, certainly, Ameline, you recognize yeah. him immediately. I think probably like the excitement and stupidity. And like maybe something in the face shape. I'm just like, Oh, yeah. Okay, that's that's that kid. Yeah, I think Aveline just kind of draws into herself a little bit more. Probably Esther would notice that they've been kind of throwing around with the familiars. And then she sees Chiron's little brother and is like, just gets a bit more serious. And maybe goes to shake his hand, kind of quite uncertainly. <laughs> He kind of awkwardly shakes her hand back and it squeezes like far too hard, just like a just like a big dude who doesn't know how strong he is. Oof, that's um, that's pretty warm. Yep, that's why you don't touch the the familiar that's made of fire. Oh yeah. It's crazy, right? It's crazy how hot that fire can be. I forget all the time and then I touch it and I'm like, oh yeah, fire's so hot. Uh so- all the time touching fire? Are you you're touching fire a lot when it's not shaped like a cute animal? Um other people are usually around to remind me not to. But sometimes when I'm alone, I forget, you know, because there's like a lot going on. Sometimes <laughs> yeah, okay. you forget things. You know how it is. But anyway, uh, listen, I think the buffet is open. I'm going to go. I'm going to go check that out. Uh, I'll, I'll hit you guys up later. And I'm going to say that the rest of the dinner proceeds not, I want to say with not without incident, but much of the same. There's kind of catching up at one point. Porla comes over and sits down. It's just really nice and cordial. You guys notice as the night goes on that there's an empty chair at the table with like a place setting and everything and like no one shows up. Is there like a name card? No, there aren't name cards. Were we expecting Um, anybody expecting anybody else? Kid, is this for your uh, partner? Uh, no, she had to, um, uh, she, she has to keep, you know, (laughs) track of the kids. Your kids? Not my kids, just the kids at the monastery, uh, back at, uh, at the volcano. Um, Porla says, that's where Chiron. Right. Year one, we're going to start the day after the final battle. The Eight of Rods. Oh my god, it calls them Rods. That's so funny. Yeah. So I'm assuming, I'm going to assume that's Wands. Oh god, this is so fucking juicy. <laughs> Your character receives a letter from one of the other party members that changes everything. What is it? So this could be any of the other player characters or the NPCs. Okay, actually, I think I receive a letter from Porla. I think like after the final battle, Kit felt like really bad and sort of like yeeted himself back to the monastery and just felt awful. I don't think that he and Porla ever actually talked that much. I don't think they were very close, but he received a letter from Porla. And I think Porla seems like the kind of person who would like just document a lot of little things. And I think that the letter is, it's not like a love letter, if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's sort of like a letter of appreciation and just like this listing of a lot of nice things that Kit did. 
So I think it changes everything in that I think Kit going back to the monastery was sort of very defeatist. Um, and he was very focused on like, you know, the monks were right the whole time. Everything I did was a waste. And I think that it starts to make him feel like he could be useful to the world at large. Porla, how are you? How are you holding up tonight? Um, you know, I'm just so busy that it's like, uh, hasn't really hit me yet. You know, there's the dedication of the memorial uh, monument. That's kind of the main event. And that's, you know, after this. So I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I'm a little nervous, but um, okay. we're going to be okay. Hey, if you, if you ever, I mean, I know tonight's pretty busy and crazy, but if you ever want to talk, you know, while we're still in town, I mean, you know where to find me. Sure. Yeah, okay. we'll do that. And uh, I think we'll we'll fast forward to the end of the dinner when uh, Kyrelius kind of gets up and speaks and he sort of gives one of his grand proclamations and he thanks the turtle DJ and everybody claps for the turtle DJ because he's the best DJ. <laughs> and and, and Kyrelius says, uh, and now the time has come for the main event. We are dedicating the memorial statue to Chiron, our hero. Uh, would you please follow me up to the hills where we will do the ceremony and unveil the monument? And he leads the crowd out sort of through campus to a secluded area that you all sort of know from just having been part of this adventuring guild and explored around the area. It's like, how do I describe it? I never know the words for nature things. It's like a tall um, cliff wall (laughs) and you're at the bottom of it. So it's like almost like a naturally occurring wall situation. And at the foot of it is like a ledge of like an elevated grassy area that has kind of slopes down on both sides and then flattens into like a lower area. And uh, you see on that lower area are, again, that kind of hodgepodge of of chairs, some folding, some non, uh, some old, Uh, you know, just really collected from just about everywhere. And uh, up on that little ledge, you see a large object covered in a tarp. And you see a podium. It's still a little sweaty. It appears to have been moving a good <laughs> few hours. <laughs> That's some really enduring sweat. Yeah, and you see there's sort of some magical uh, magical fairy lights and, and enchanted torches and things kind of lighting the way. It's really beautiful. And Kyrelius escorts you guys to two places of honor in the front row. Naraya just follows this entire thing and just sits down isn't keeping track of who's next to her and y'all can make this choice for yourselves but like as soon as she sits down she offers her left hand to be held by like whoever is on her left when swip will take that seat and grip it grip it tight i think aveline has addy doing that thing that service dogs do for people who are nervous in public spaces where they kind of just walk around the person in a little circle to like give them space so she's like walking up to the front row with this tiny antelope just kind of doing the loops around her to kind of keep people from getting a bit too close and um sits as far away from paula as possible for this moment. She can sw- she can sit next to Winswip. Winswip will hold out her other hand. Um, you guys actually see that Porla isn't sitting with you guys. She's off standing with Kyrelius and another and a woman who you guys recognize as the assistant head of the of the guild. She's like this very stern tiefling woman named Willa who never smiles ever and uh, is certainly not smiling now. But Porla is standing with them in a place of great importance and it, she looks very like official and it kind of hits you guys like yeah, she really works here and she's like really hot shit in the adventuring guild i think i actually sit next to esther and i'm like all of this like being reminded of this is why we're here i think kit sort of has his head hunched or he's sort of hunched over with his hands like on his knees folded over and he takes a big sigh and says esther i i you know it's been really hard today um and i'm sorry i snapped at you back there i think we've all had to deal with this in our own way and um I'm really sorry about that. I don't think Chiron would have wanted us to be snapping at each other like this. Yeah. I mean, she probably wouldn't have minded the uh, aggression from us. Yeah. That's a good Listen, point. Yeah. I think she would have gotten a kick out yeah. of that. Listen, Kit, I did take what you said to heart so deeply, but I'm also expressing that information 
in my own way. And I'm not, and that is, that is what it is. Yeah. No, I, I totally get it. And I think Esther puts his arm around Kit and just like leaves it there and just kind of like brings him in uh, pretty tight. Yeah. And I think I, you know, accept that. And Kit like leans over, like on the verge of crying, I think whatever's about to happen, like I think it'll like send him over, depending on what it is. Just as you feel the tears about to spill over, you see some of the fairy lights dim and they all sort of concentrate on this makeshift stage, this ledge with this covered memorial that we're all waiting to see unveiled in this podium. And up to the podium steps Kyrelius Murray in his burgundy shabby suit. And he says, uh, well, good, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is the main event. This is what we're all here for. Of course, I've got a, a little, uh, little speech prepared for this occasion. So I want to say uh, the following to you. He kind of holds out his paw at Willa, the stern tiefling lady, just like ugh, scoffs and like holds out a piece of parchment for him. And he unscrolls it and he says, Welcome, esteemed guests. We are here today to commemorate the sacrifice of the greatest and noblest hero to ever pass through the halls of St. Simone's Adventuring Guild, the noble Chiron O'Marilai. As we all know, Chiron sacrificed her life to turn the tides of the Battle of Horizon Fall so that our bravest heroes could prevail against the evil dreadnought and its minions. In honor of the 10-year anniversary of this heroic sacrifice and victory, it is my honor as head adventurer of St. Simone's to present to you this beautiful statue of Chiron. May her image inspire many generations of future heroes to choose the path of goodness above all. And you see Porla and Willa pull down this tarp and you see this gorgeous massive statue in the likeness of your fallen friend Chiron it's she was pretty tall but it's definitely taller than she was but she would have liked uh <laughs> she always wanted to be a little taller she's not exactly smiling but she looks a little bit mischievous half elf with short hair in one hand she's holding her this massive beautiful sword aloft and the other hand is is sort of over her heart and she has a cape and beautiful armor. And the armor is actually kind of made of brass or like some sort of like goldish metal. And that's adorning the the white marble because those were sort of her colors were white and gold. Yeah, it's just, um, it's it's a lot. I think it's a lot. It's it's a really, really beautiful monument. And there's a there's sort of a moment of silence as everybody just kind of regards it. And then Kyrelius says... <clears throat> It is at this time that I would like to invite Chiron's brother, Cabriel O'Marillay, to the stage to deliver a poem that he has written for this momentous occasion. Like, tearfully, you hear Naraya whisper, oh no. <laughs> 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 like, I'm fully sobbing, but I'm also like, oh, this is not about to be a good poem. You see Cabriel take the stage from where he's sitting. He's on the other side of the front row sitting with his parents who are also like very much weeping at this point. His dad kind of grabs a shoulder and is like, you can do it, son. And then he gets up on stage. As he stands at the podium, you are struck by how charming he is obviously he's like super attractive but he also just has one of those presences where even though you know the poem is gonna suck dog <laughs> shit you're still excited for the poem and uh he's already he's already a little bit tearful and he says uh uh thank you Kyrelius. this is a poem that i wrote i'm more of like a music guy but uh you know poetry is also um really important to me so, and I, I, I thought I would do a song, but Chiron always hated it when I sang at things because I think she was probably mad that I was so good at it. But, you know, I thought it's, it's her day, so I won't, I won't upstage her. Um, and then he kind of like laughs and looks up at the giant statue and is like, as if that were possible. So he says, okay, here we go. <clears throat> and he starts doing like some vocal warm up. Oh my god. <laughs> Esther, like, under his breath is like, I fucking hate this guy. I turn and try to give Esther a meaningful look of, like, this is what people think you're like. I, I think I'm sitting next to Esther and I'm just like, you're just jealous. You're just jealous because he's even more of a little handsome golden retriever than you are. Shut up. Let him read his <laughs> poem. I'm talking to you, Abilene. What's <laughs> I talking to you? just fully whisper bickering as you hear this poem start. I think he's going to be great. I think he's going to be great. Look at him. Look at him. He's fine. He's fine. He actually looks at you meaningfully as he starts and he looks at you guys in the front row and you freeze and you're awkward fighting. He says, 
They came from all over, the glorious eight. They came without knowing they'd do something great. The party set out to explore lands uncharted, but stumbled on evil soon after they started. A monster too large to be properly caught. It took much pursuing this terror dreadnought. But after much questing came the final brawl, the infamous battle of Horizon Fall. Like a shadow, Naraya stealthed into the fray, fearlessly drawing first blood of the day. Following close, slinging fire came Esther. Not bad for the son of a futures investor. Pause for laughter. <laughs> oh no, does he say ha. pause for laughter? You know he does. Ha, ha. Hilarious. Ha. <laughs> Um, this is a very accurate recap. Wow. Uh, he continues. Brave Kit single-handedly dispatched a horde of minions spawned solely to serve the Dark Lord. But the Dreadnought was mighty and felt little pain until Aveline thought to transform the terrain. Thus hindered, the Dreadnought was clearly in trouble. It barely could walk through the vines and the rubble. Windswip slashed with all her considerable might, but... All hope seemed lost when the dreadnought took flight. And then he, like, very loudly turns a page. A win seemed impossible. Defeat was nigh. For how could they slay a dreadnought in the sky? When suddenly Chiron the paladin knew in her heart the brave deed that she needed to do. She knew she possessed a great blessing of light, a boon from her god to give strength in the fight. But if she deployed all that light in one blast and aimed for the dreadnought... They might win at last. So knowing the blast would destroy her as well, she fulfilled her duty and the great flyer fell. Sweet Porla, who healed everyone with such ease, found that Chiron was gone and fell to her knees. But the fight was not over, as well you all know, until Brex intervened with that fatal last blow. And when they plunged their sanctified sword into the heart of the dreadnought, it smoldered and crumbled apart. The battle was won, the land was at peace, but for Chiron, our sorrow would only increase. Now 10 years have passed and we still miss our girl. <sighs> I'm sorry, and then he runs off stage. I, Jamie, actually teared up at that. I was gonna make a joke about that being what a brown education produces, but I am actually crying. <laughs> Listen, it's hard to write a bad poem when you're me, but I, uh, I do. I'll do anything for. I'll do anything for you guys. So he runs off stage. You see Porla look very concerned and, and chase after him. Like, wait, come, uh, come back. Wait, wait, uh, Gabriel. And up to the podium steps, Kyralius. I think we can all agree that this is, you know, that was beautiful and. And, and, and you know, we can just imagine in our hearts what the last line of the poem would have been. I'm sure it would have rhymed with girl somehow, and it would have been simply beautiful. So thank you, Cabriel, for that lovely... All of a sudden, the ground beneath you just shakes violently. Everybody needs to make a constitution saving throw uh, DC 16. Who could have foreseen... Naraya let her guard down after the statue was revealed and it wasn't anything horrible. 22. 13, I don't make it. Did you say 16? Mm -hmm. 22. Uh, I got a 17. 13. Fail. If you passed, you're okay. If you failed, you are knocked prone. Um, you fall out of your seat onto the ground. Ow. And you are all showered with rubble and hard frozen ground as you hear a great screeching. It's like a scream that is somehow so inhuman and yet also a little bit scarily human. And as you look up and you see this rain of dust and dirt and a little bit of old snow falling down around you, you see in the place where Kyralius was and the place where the stage was a massive gaping toothy maw. And it is attached to a large like cylindrical worm type creature that is slowly and painfully screaming its way out of the earth. It is covered with these hooks that are like old stone that's been frozen and unfrozen hundreds of times and the earth around it is steaming and you see these waves of heat emanating from it and you see the frozen ground around it thawing into mud. It is chaos. You hear screaming, you hear scrambling and uh, the last thing 
that I will say is you hear, it's not much considering all of the chaos going on. You hear a creak and you hear the Chiron statue start to tip and as if in slow motion, you see it tip over and start to fall and it hits the earth with a thud. Oh no. And I need everyone to roll initiative. Oh, how could oh, you? Oh, Baby, okay. Let's do it. Oh, God. 19. 15. 12. 6. Oh, good. Dirty 20. Anton Chekhov has said a lot of smart things about guns. And there was a covered big, big thing <laughs> that's been covered. There also was a gun. I... <laughs> I was gonna yeah, say, where's, where's the, the one gun? Yeah, where's the one gun? <laughs> one gun to rule them all. <laughs> one gun to find them. <laughs> oh no. This is not what Tolkien intended. Listen, I could have I could have very easily been like really taken this and been like, global warming killed everyone, so we have to kill the final gun. Uh, <laughs> gross. <laughs> oh, thank Capitalism you. was the enemy all along. Okay, so so it's Windswip and um, Kit on the ground, I think, right? Everyone else passed. Of course it is. <laughs> You're having like Just I mean. want there to be a little like cinematic moment where both of you fall and it's like, uh, oh like, shit, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We definitely lock eyes for a second and just. Uh... <laughs> we'll talk about this later. There's nothing to talk about. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't remember what spells I prepared. I am going to say for you guys, I think everybody would have like all of their standard armor and weapons on them just because I think ceremonially it would be like in the same way that you wear your like military uniform with your fancy sword and stuff. I was just debating about whether Winsup would need to make a dash to just like steal someone's weapon from them. Just like, hold on, I need this. No, I think you would all as these like guests of honor known warriors like have your, your weapons on What's you. What's the size class of the worm? Uh, large. large. Good. Okay. Large worm. Okay. <laughs> Big boy. That was a third of my HP. <laughs> can oh we, God. Megan, oh, wait. Never, never. Wait. Can we say never. that Porla healed this poor man? She <laughs> yeah, was during dinner. Table. It, unless, Megan, yeah. I would have asked. You want you skipped forward, but I would have. Okay, I was very pressed. You guys would have. Okay, he was I large. will. I will say that you are healed back up to maximum, and that Porla was more than happy to do that for you. Also, Thank I could have. I myself could have done a, a cure wounds or a, for the love of God, please save yeah, we'll say yourself. Porla did it. Um, okay, Porla did it. Um, I did not yeah. cast cure wounds. I'll say she casted it at second level and got you all the way up to full. You see the great gaping maw of this beast, which as this wormy beast emerges, you start to see it a little bit more clearly and you realize it's got it's got these like great beady eyes and this massive gaping maw and these antenna coming off of its head like a giant bug. It has whiskers. There's a lot going on with this thing. It is screaming and finally it seems like it lets out this noise like it's like dislodged something from its throat and it lets out this great cough like <laughs> And out of its mouth, you see fly this dark shadow, vaguely humanoid in shape, but very wispy. It's mostly just like black shadows whirling around. And all you can really make out is a pair of yellow eyes and like a spiked crown on its head. And it flies out of this worm's mouth as it kind of coughs it up. And it looks around and then it sets its eyes on the worm again and it shoots out a tendril almost like a long leash that it wraps around the worm's neck and it just yanks as hard as it it appears as hard as it can which is quite hard and the worm screams again and you guys are all watching this with this like horrible morbid fascination and suddenly Naraya and Kit and also Brex you all feel feel this sudden sharp sting in your neck. And as you reach up, uh, you feel like this furry proboscis and you realize you were being set upon by this nasty ass, like giant bat creature. And I'm going to go ahead and roll damage at this point for that. And this nasty ass bat creature is separate from the shadow and separate yeah, from Those the came at you from behind. And it's... It's Yikes, multiple man. bat creatures or okay, just Okay, so one? there's three nasty ass bats. One per each. One per each. Yes. Megan, we're level five. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
welcome to Quest Laid Plans. We will be having a TPK. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed our answer to the question, can an old party learn new tricks? The answer, no. No. <laughs> no, they can't because they're dead. Uh, 15 hits you right, Naraya. Uh, yeah, Look what does. you made me made do. Me do. <laughs> can we be serious and being hit? It, it kind of, you feel it kind of claw at you and you manage to get out of the way, but that, that thing in your neck is really, uh, is really lodged in there and you can feel it sucking your blood out and it is going to be eight Jesus. piercing damage and okay. 10 necrotic damage. Jesus. Not Jesus, because he doesn't exist, but ow. I will say, I think that Jesus probably does exist. I think that everybody probably kept their religious beliefs, it, you know, just in addition to the ones that... that... Yes, yeah, let's establish this now. <laughs> yeah, this is a great time. As you're being sucked dry by a giant bat, can we talk about Christian theology's role in my world? <laughs> All right, uh, I am now going to assess the damage on Kit. 16 to hit. It's going to be, so it's also going to be 8 piercing and 10 necrotic for you as well. Cool, cool, cool. A 17 is also going to hit you. It's going to claw, it's going to rake one of its claws down your back as well for an additional uh, 7 slashing damage and 6 acid damage. Oh, <gasps> you six are acid, you do you said? not take, you're resistant, right? I'm, I'm resistant, so that's half. Mm -hmm. Yes. Water Janazi. <laughs> yes, yeah, so as you're being clawed and Thank sucked God. dry by this giant bat thing, you're sitting here <laughs> thinking like, well, that acid only hurts a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and God is dead. Why are you being Isn't mean that just how it is? You have to get mean right back. Sometimes you have to be mean. All right, so it's going to hit Brex with a claw and a, su a suck and a claw. <laughs> the old suck and claw combo. <laughs> <laughs> the old suck and claw. It's my favorite. Uh. It's my favorite bar. Here. That's a fun Friday night. <laughs> I mean, that's someone's gig. <laughs> yeah, no. For yeah, sure. someone. You know, we have a lot of fun here at Quest Laid Plans, but uh, yeah, we're all having fun. I need Quest to orient myself. Can you remind me roughly what order you guys were sitting in? I know you had sort of like established one. I think it would be. I assume Brex was sitting next to Naraya as well. Yeah. So I've been picturing Brex, Naraya, Windswip, Aveline, Esther, Kit. That tracks. Yeah. Also, from a mechanical standpoint, Addy is actually not a familiar. She is a wildfire spirit who is technically an extension of my own soul. And in order to summon her, I have to expend one use of my wild shape. And basically, right. instead of changing my own form, I summon her. Wild shape lasts for two hours. So if we say that she's been around since like the beginning of the dinner, that is hopefully within the two hour window and she can still be here without me having to like resummon her. Sure, yeah. And you can't like wild shape yourself while she's out, right? No. Okay. Windswip, it is your turn. Okay, so Windswip has been knocked prone. So first of all, well, as she's kind of lying there and she just sees all of this, all of this happening, and Kit is also knocked prone and is being fed on, but also Naraya is right next to her. So she uses half her movement to get up, and yeah, she's just gonna go for it. She just she gets up, shouts Naraya's name, and she uses one of her giant's might, and she becomes large. She oh, shoots up in, yeah. in height and breadth and just becomes Lord. this huge <laughs> big Lord, Lord uh, <laughs> gnome and at the same time she pulls her warhammer off her back and this warhammer is a steel warhammer but it has it's inlaid with like rose quartz and has kind of butterfly designs on the on the sides <gasps> of the heads and she just yells get off of her and tries to bring it down <laughs> on the bat thing that is attacking Naraya. all right I guess that means i have to roll for an attack 13. That does not hit. It's a little hard to hit because it's slapping in the air. And as we know from the final battle, flying things are not your forte. Wow. Okay. Just. <laughs> Basically, what I'm going to ask you is without going into like outcome, what would be Windswip's plan tactic going into this battle? better or for worse, Windswip's plan is just to try to draw its attention, in particular because she can get large, and it still wouldn't mean much to a kaiju-sized thing, but she can, she can take a hit and smack it a few times with her hammer enough to try to present the biggest singular threat to it. 
She 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 goes and she's like one v one me. <laughs> yeah, like pick on someone your own size, or it, you know, comparatively as close as we can get here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's she's. I think as a large creature, I think she's like maybe nine feet tall max. So still not like anything compared to something of the size that I am imagining, but taller than everyone else. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to have you roll 2d20 or 1d20 twice, and just tell me both numbers. Okay. Oh, boy. We have a 5 and a 6. So the first number represents how much you contributed to the final battle, like how, from an objective standpoint, like how well you did. And the second number represents how well you think you did, or like how you feel afterwards so ah. the good news is that you seem to have like a pretty accurate you know understanding of what's going on <laughs> how little i contributed yeah great given that given your tactic and your and these numbers like what sort of how would you describe what happened i think it just she got its attention for one round and then it probably took flight so you said anything that i say anything goes i love that i'm going to say like the one of the most annoying things about being a fighter or any kind of martial based class is when the enemy is in the air so i would say that it like took a hit probably hit her back but then took off and she was left swinging at nothing. And even with all of her extra little like bags of tricks, cause she has some things that can be mobile. Like she has a misty step and, and she can levitate a little bit up, up, but like she couldn't, she never got another solid hit on it again because then it started changing its strategy and kind of flying around and giving advantage to anyone else who has more ranged attacks yeah. at their disposal. So. I can see her too like, just continuing to just like take hits and take hits and eventually that would like you know take its toll <laughs> yeah i think maybe it would it was good at swooping down hitting her back and she just like missed it, most of her opportunity attacks as soon as it flew away you know kind of thing so she got hit more than she hit it and that was that would be pretty frustrating for her definitely yeah um and that. she her being aware of that <laughs> makes a lot of sense Well, luckily, I get an extra attack. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to try that again. 17. That is going to hit. Okay, yes. Great. So she hits that for... When when you use a Warhammer with two hands, I think it's one a d10 of damage. So that is what is happening. Nine plus three is 12. And then with Giant's Might, I get to roll another d6. So six... So that is nice. 18 points of damage to the bat. Hell yeah. What do you do to this bat with your war hammer? Fucking squash it. <laughs> yeah, you smash this bat. And when you raise your hammer back up, it kind of like flaps and flaps and flaps until it works itself out of this hole that you've put it in in the ground. And uh, it's not dead, but it looks flatter than it did before. <laughs> Flat bat, if you will. Flat bat. Flat the bats, everyone. Flat the bats. Flat bats. You yell. Uh, <laughs> cool. Is that your turn? Yes, that is everything. Okay. Uh, next in the order is Esther. Okay. So since I am right next to Kit, Esther is going to grab the bat and nice. use shocking grasp on it. Hell yeah. Over 20 to hit. That is going to hit. Great. So that's 2d8 lightning. A seven and a six, so 13 lightning damage. Hey. Turns out you don't have to just flat the bats, you could also just zap the bats. And it's still still trekking? Yeah, its wings looked a little yeah. bit singed, but uh, it is it is still going, yeah. Okay, then I will... Ooh, I want to do this. Yes, you do. Okay, I'm going to do a quicken spell. Yeah, just try to fucking zap this thing again. Zap the bats. You can do a spell and a cantrip, but I don't think you can do the same thing twice. Shocking grasp is a... Uh, it's a cantrip. Can you do two cantrips? I, I yes. don't see why not. Yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. I don't think I've ever done it before, but yeah. All right, cool. I'll allow it. If it's two cantrips, I don't see why not. Uh, yeah, that hits again. 17 plus 7. Okay. And then 8 and 5, so 13 again. You send down one lightning bolt after another, strikes it in each one of its wings. It lets out like this horrible like <sighs> sound, and it pops its weird nose out of Kit's neck uh, and kind great. of flails in the air. Am I able to pick Kit up, or that's 
also an action, so not my turn. That's probably an action. I think that's okay. Yeah, because he's not an object. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Justifying. Kit's not an object. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You're not just a piece of meat. Um. <laughs> Anyway, Naraya, it's your turn if that's if that's everything. Oh god. Okay. So I'm being I have a bat flattened, but still like is it on me? Am I engaged with this bat? I think that it's engaged with Windswept, but it's not. It would have been forcefully disengaged from you when when it was hit. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Well, in that case, has anyone dealt with the warm or the weird shadow situation? There's one more um bat. That's a tech brex. Yeah, and there is one there is one more bat. Okay, I would like to take my movement to just leap over this row of chairs because I'm imagining we're kind of like stuck in this seating arrangement. So I'm going to take my movement to just be in the clear a little bit more. And then, ah, fuck it. I'm just going to firebolt the... And that's a bolt, not a ball. It's the cantrip. I'm not cool enough for a firebolt just yet. I'm going to firebolt the bat that's on Brex. Okay. 15 to hit. That does not hit. God damn it. Okay, that's fine. So what I'm going to do is, as my bonus action, I will hide. You hide behind Windswip. <laughs> yeah, I hide behind Windswip's massive calf muscles. <laughs> Sweet calves. Yeah, never skip leg day. I am taking my cunning action awesome kit it is your turn okay so we have all three bats are still up and two of them have been hit and how far is like the furthest one from me so i think it's probably the one on brax and that one would be like like 65 feet away okay that's good to know first thing i'll do the one near me i'm just gonna i'm just gonna punch it so i've i or i'm gonna get up from prone so that's half my speed and then as i get up from prone i like flip around and just like ground myself and then go for a punch. Hell yeah, punch that bat. And that is 20 to hit. That's gonna hit. All right, so that does six damage. Still up. Yeah, it's looking pretty bloodied. Okay, and then I will, sure. So I have my sling out as well. The strike was actually, was like a punch where I'm holding, I'm like holding the sling and I punched it. And then I turn around and I swing around my sling and fire a rock for my second attack over at the bat that is on Brex. Mm -hmm. 23 to hit. Yeah, you bean that thing. Bean the bat. Bean that. (laughs) That's only two. (laughs) So I just, I just ping it. And then I'll use a key point to do flurry of blows on the bat that's near me. So that's two more, two more attacks. Okay, roll them up. Those are so cool. We love monks. I don't think either of those hit. A 15 doesn't hit? No. Okay, yeah. I got a 15 and a 1. This is a Kit Marple is no good, horrible, very bad day. <laughs> very bad day. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, very bad day. It can only go up from here. Or you can die. Oh, God. All right. At this point, it is Porla's turn, and she is currently cowering off to the side behind Cabriel and a tree that she has found, but she pokes her head out enough to call out to hear her say, like, Axiom, guide me, in, like, a very magical girl way. And she's going to send a mass healing word towards Kit and Brex and Naraya. And I think that's the only people who are damaged, right? I mean, physically right now, yes. Yeah, we are all taking emotional damage. And it's going to be for six points of healing. Thank you. Okay, and then um, she is going to proceed to hide once more, and then it is Aveline's turn. Okay, so no one has hit the worm yet, or the shadowy humanoid with the whip? Correct. Did it look like the shadowy humanoid was trying to hurt the worm or trying to control it. Can I make like an insight check? Yes. Yeah, go for it. I'll let you do that for free. That's a 12. You couldn't really tell whether it was trying to hurt or control it, but it definitely was pissing it off, was uh, riling it up. Okay. Well, I'm going to, firstly, I'm going to use my bonus action to command Addy because I have to use a bonus action to command her to do anything on her turn other than dodge, but she goes after me. And then for my main action... I'm going to do a second level scorching ray, which is three rays. And I think I'm going to 
throw two of them at the worm and one of them at the humanoid. Okay. So... Burn that worm. Burn that worm. <laughs> I'm assuming a 10 doesn't hit the worm? It does not, and I will also say that not only does it miss, but based on the way the fire kind of interacts with like the heat coming up, when the fire kind of enters the general area of the worm, it just sort of gets sucked inside of the worm and doesn't seem to really, it doesn't even feel it. Okay, then can I say I'd like to throw the second and the third rays at the humanoid rather than the worm? If I see that yes. the first one like just doesn't do anything. Yeah. 22 to hit and mm-hmm. a 15 to hit. Those will both hit. Cool. It's nine damage. A big nine damage. A big nine. Um, for the humanoid. It is actually going to be a big four because it is resistant oh, no. to fire damage. And I will t- I will tell you, though, for your check that you did to see sort of what its intentions were, you weren't really able to discern exactly what the intentions were, but you were able to get a good look at both creatures and you were able to see that this is a wraith which you may have encountered perhaps in your in your druiding. It looks just kind of like a grim reaper, honestly, but like made of smoke, uh, just very classic looking thing. You've probably seen them around. They're generally sort of a malevolent spirit. And you also see, you definitely recognize the worm thing. Uh, you see it has, once you see it has many legs, you're like, oh, okay. That is a remoraz, which is a giant subterranean creature native to this area, which you would, no is like a very dangerous predator to this geographical area but you also would know that the adventurers guild is supposed to have a electric fence situation to keep them out so you've never seen one but you've certainly seen like pictures it's very like be careful don't touch them if you see them or you will be dead so they're native to the area but normally they're kept out with an electric fence I mean, I don't know if it's literally an electric fence, but it's it's a fence that would suppress the... It's a zappy magic field thing. It's almost like the opposite of that, where it, it suppresses the vibrations that they would normally feel from people walking oh, around cool. above ground. So they could, like, uh, hop up and eat them. Walk without rhythm. There you go. Uh, let's see, is that your turn, Evelyn? That's my turn, but then Addie has her turn. Cool. So I have commanded her to act, and she's going to do Flame Seed, which is a... <laughs> really annoying being a wildfire druid fighting some enemies that are resistant to fire. So if I was sitting at the same end of the benches as Kit, is there still a bat kind of engaged with him? Actually, you're probably closer to the bat that's engaged with Windswip. I think that one's like right next to you. Okay, then Addy is going to make a ranged weapon attack against the bat that's engaged with Windswip. I rolled three sevens in a row on this same dice. Um, That's a 14 to hit. It's not gonna hit. That's it, that's my turn. Also, as long as we've named all the other monsters, the bats are strigoi. They're like bats, but they have long proboscises and are gross. I hate that. They're like bat yeah. vampires. That's super gross. They're like, like if it. the monster manual was Pokemon, they're like an evolved the next evolution up from a sturge. Okay, so it is now the worm's turn, and the worm is going to attempt to bite the wraith. Twist. 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 Yeah, it snaps its jaws at the wraith and just completely, it, it's made of, you know, wisps and smoke and it just is a little too fast for it. The worm is also going to continue its movement and kind of worm its way down. <laughs> worm its way down to worm town. <laughs> Won't you take me to wormy town? It's going to start to uh, worm its way down the slope around on to closer to where you guys are around the side where uh, Brex and Naraya are. So the worm, like in the wraith, emerged basically like from the like the raised green platform thing. Yes. And now it's coming down. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's coming down the slope. Is the slope like a sheer face or like, is it like a little like gradual? It's a sheer face in the center up to the little ledge where the, it's like the stage ledge situation. And then it's like almost like ramped on the sides, but like naturally so. I see. So it's like the stage is against a sheer face mm-hmm. and then the stage slopes down yes, from there. Yes, on either side. Okay. All right. So it is now going to be Brax's turn and you see Brax draw a weapon that looks like it's like made out of like spinning black molecules of energy like it's like impossible to perceive it's like what the fuck am I looking at it shouldn't be that shouldn't be physically possible you see Brex go into a rage 
and a few things happen. One, Brex is a wild magic barbarian, uh, so I need to yeah, roll on the table. Yeah, <laughs> magic. Is that legal? Barbarian? Yeah, it is legal. Is this is this allowed? <laughs> So you see a bolt of lightning shoot from their chest as they go in a rage. It shoots out between the many belts over the bare chest situation. It's very aesthetic. (laughs) And it's going to shoot out towards the worm. The worm has to make a constitution saving throw. So we're going to do that now. And that's going to be... How good can the constitution of a giant worm be? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, worms are squishy. It's squishy. Yeah. It's DC. It can be big and squishy. Me just bargaining (laughs) this briefly. (laughs) It succeeds, so it it gets zapped, but doesn't appear to be too wildly harmed by that. And let's see. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is you see this weapon that Brex had drawn. It starts to sort of morph into the shapes of different weapons. It's kind of cycling through. It's a double-bladed scimitar, and then it's a glaive, and then it's a morning star. And as it's sort of rouletting through all of these, it starts to slow down, and it settles into this just massive great sword. at which point it sort of stops being less... Uh, it stops being so fuzzy and starts being more corporeal. Fucking cool, dude. That's so fucking... You that's lucky so fucking bastard. Dude. I want a quantum weapon. <laughs> It is going to... I just need to look up. The only problem with this fucking dope weapon is I have to look up what every weapon does every time it changes. Oh no, the struggle of just having access to every single weapon fucking sucks. Very hard. Okay, so it's going to be 2d6 damage. To clarify, uh, the sword is called Bedlam, and it... It's not that you get to pick every time, although tech, I, so there's a table. There's a table of 20 options, and if you crit, you get to pick, and I actually crit, so I got to pick, and I just picked a great sword because it was the first thing I thought of. So you see, after the lightning thing sort of bounces off of the worm, you see Brex sort of growl and turn his attention to the fucking Strigoi that is engaged with him, and just in these two massive slashes of this great sword, you see blood fly everywhere and splatter all over him. It's his blood because it was you know, sucked out of him. Oh, God. <laughs> it, this, this thing looks very worse for wear. At this point, you hear a creak. You hear a great no. creak. And you see that just as it had fallen over, the Chiron statue has started to rise as though somebody is very carefully lifting it. Although nobody is lifting it. If you were to look a little further to your right, you can see that from from a ways off, you see Cabriel using his magic to sort of, at a distance, lift the statue up back to its upright position. And as it hits its mark and stands, you see uh, the statue start to move and draw its sword down. take its other hand off of its heart and it squares up and faces the wraith. And that's where we're going to end this episode. Oh my god. <sighs> uh, we're very much dying. <laughs> so good. In the middle of battle. We're very much dying. Thank you everybody for listening and we will bye. see you bye. next time. Bye. Love you. Bye. bye. Cue the bossa nova version of Take Me to Church. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, it's me, Megan. I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to our second episode, and I wanted to really, really, really thank you for all of the wonderful feedback we got from episode one. It was so much fun to share it with everybody, as I said last time, just like surreal to put out into the world and hear that people like it. And we would love to keep that positive energy going. And so if you want, there are lots of different ways you can support us. Uh, We have a Patreon now. That's patreon.com forward slash quest laid plans. If you want to give us a small monthly contribution and exchange exchange for some really cool bonus content that we're cooking up for you. And if you want to support us in a non-fiduciary way, please stay tuned for a message right after this from our very own Jesse B. Kohler. Bye-bye. Hey, questies. You got friends? Are you at a lack of words of what to say to them? Have I got the words for you? Quest Laid Plans is the best podcast I've ever listened to. It's taught me so much about myself. See, questies, that's all you have to say. Saying words out loud aren't really your thing? Write them down in a review for us and put some stars next to it. Proverbably five.